Hello, zoology people. Today, I want to talk to you about the phyla platyhelminthes. Platyhelminthes are the flatworms. Platy meaning flat. So platyhelminthes, the flatworms, have very simple characteristics, but they are more advanced than our previous phylas. We originally started talking about periphera, the sea sponges, and then nidaria, the sea jellies. Well, platyhelminthes are our first animal that we're talking about that has three layers. They are triploblastic. Their three layers are their endoderm, the inside layer, the mesoderm, the middle layer, and the ectoderm. So a three-layered animal, platyhelminthes. These guys are somewhat cephalized, meaning that they kind of have a head area. They have an aggregation of nerve cells, and we consider that a brain. So these worms have a very simple brain. They don't have a complete gut or digestive system. What does it mean to have an incomplete digestive system? This means that they don't have an anus. They only have a mouth. And you might be thinking, ew, what? How does that work? Well, if you only had a mouth, it would be way more disgusting than what actually takes place with these worms. And so it's not so much pooping out of your mouth. The way it really works is platyhelminthes worms, they eat their food through a pharyngeal opening. So they take in this food, and then what they do is they keep the food inside their gut they absorb the nutrients, and then when they're done, they spit that food out. And so they don't necessarily have a mouth on their head. Instead, they have a pharynx in the middle of their body, a feeding tube. This pharynx opens up, engulfs their food, they keep it in that gut sac, they absorb the nutrients, and then spit it out when they're done. And so we refer to that as an incomplete digestive system. These worms are flat for a reason. They have a very simple circulatory system. Their fluids are just in there. And so they don't have veins. They don't have any mechanism of pumping their blood around or their fluids or any of that. And so they have to stay flat in order to help with osmoregulation. They don't have kidneys or anything that the more advanced animals have. Instead, they have something called protonephridia. Protonephridia is a network of membranes that help absorb and excrete waste. And so this is the basics of what eventually becomes kidneys in more advanced animals. But these are the simple steps of evolution where we first get the excretory system of organisms filtering their fluids. And we call this protonephridia. I want to talk to you about a few classes of platyhelminthes. The first one is turbillaria. The turbillarians are free-living flatworms. Free-living meaning they're not parasites. And the most popular one in freshwater is the planarian. And so I use planarians in my lab all the time. They are a fantastic worm to study because they're made up of mostly stem cells. And so a lab that we like to do with planarians is we'll take them under a microscope and we can cut their head using a scalpel. And because they have so many stem cells, they will grow two heads. If you were to cut their tail, they would grow two tails. If you cut a planarian worm in half, the tail end grows a new head and the head end grows a new tail. And they're capable of doing this because they are made up of mostly stem cells. And now you might be horrified going, wait, you're chopping up worms in your lab. Well, because they have that aggregation of nerves, that very simple brain, they don't feel pain. Instead, they just have nerve reflexes. Kind of like when you tap your knee and you kick, that's pretty much how their entire nervous system works. And so planarians are fantastic to play with in the lab. They're our most common freshwater turbillarian. The majority of turbillarians are um, marine. They live in the ocean, and we have some beautiful turbillarians. Uh, they are called turbillarians because of the way they swim, they create a little bit of turbulence in the water. Our next class of platyhelminthes are the trematodes. The trematodes, also known as flukes, are all parasitic. They have a very interesting life cycle. So the trematodes, what happens is they are reproducing and living in their main host. And then what happens is they release their eggs in the host's feces. 
that feces will then somehow end up washed into a pond or water. And then those eggs hatch. They hatch into the larval form of the trematodes. That larval form will then burrow into what we call an intermediate host. The intermediate host is a host on the stepping stone to get to the main host. In most cases with flukes or trematodes, the intermediate host is gonna be a snail or a crustacean of some type. And so they'll burrow into crabs or they'll burrow into snails. Let's pretend that it's a snail. So this larva trematode will burrow into the flesh of a snail, and then it'll start eating the snail and growing larger. Once it's reached a certain size, it'll turn into what we call a sporocyst. A sporocyst is a dormant version of this trematode. So it kind of turns into a little cyst inside the snail, and it will just stay like that until it finds the opportunity to get into the main host. How does that happen? Well, the main host will eat that snail. So this sporocyst is in the flesh of the snail. And let's pretend a sheep eats that snail, because this does happen. And so maybe the sheep comes by and the sheep is eating grass or whatever's on the ground and there's also a snail and it eats that snail. Well, the stomach acid of the sheep then triggers the sporocyst to emerge. Now it's an adult trematode. It will burrow into the flesh of that sheep where it'll go to its main home, either the lungs or the liver, sometimes the intestines. And so if it were to go into the lungs, it'll burrow into the lungs where then it'll start reproducing and then it releases eggs, which get coughed up and swallowed by the mammal. And so you are coughing up blood and swallowing the eggs, which come out in your feces, which repeats the cycle. And so this is the life cycle of most trematodes. We have a lot of them. Uh, there are lung flukes, there are liver flukes, intestinal flukes. We can catch flukes from eating fish, from eating crustaceans, from eating mollusks, all undercooked. And so the sporocyst lives in the intermediate host, and then the adult is gonna live in the main host. The next class of platyhelminthes I wanna talk about are called monogia. They're called monogia because they only have one life cycle, mono meaning one, gia for generation. And so monogia, they're different than the trematodes. They are also a fluke, but they're different in the fact that they only have one life cycle. So what happens is they will end up in a host where they will then reproduce and that host will then release the eggs. And then those eggs will hatch and then the larva form will like burrow into the main host and then infect a new host where then it'll reproduce again and then the same cycle happens over and over again. So they only have one host, unlike the trematodes which have multiple hosts. They have intermediate hosts and a main host. But monogia and trematodes are both parasitic flukes. The last class of platyhelminthes I wanna talk about is cestoidia, or the cestoids. Cestoidia are tapeworms. It's important to keep in mind that platyhelminthes worms, or flatworms, are unsegmented. Their bodies are smooth without segments. But whenever you think of a tapeworm, you think of segments. Well, those aren't really segments. Each section of a tapeworm is a new generation of tapeworm. You have the head which attaches to a host and then it starts growing new segments. Each one of those segments is full of eggs that will be released. Okay, so yeah, a tapeworm is a flatworm, a platyhelminthes, and it's a multi-generational tapeworm or multi-generational flatworm, just like the trematodes. The tapeworms, they start off as eggs and feces, and then their larval form will end up inside an intermediate host. When it's in the intermediate host, it will grow and then burrow into the flesh of that intermediate host where it will become a sporocyst, just like in the trematodes. Then, once a sporocyst, it'll just stay dormant its whole life waiting for something to eat that intermediate host. And so once 
the main host eats that intermediate host, the stomach acid will then trigger the rest of the generation of that tapeworm. The tapeworm will then end up in the intestines of the host where it will continue to grow and release those eggs into the feces, repeating the cycle. And so if we talk about human tapeworms, the ones that we get, they're actually not human tapeworms. They're either pork tapeworms or they're beef tapeworms. And what happens is, let's pretend that I'm a, a field worker or I'm a farmer who lives out in a farm and there's a cattle ranch. And so what happens is maybe I have a tapeworm and I go to the bathroom in the field. So I take a poop in the field and it ends up all over the grass. Well, the rain could wash it or whatever, but the eggs end up sticking to the grass. The cow will come by, it'll eat that grass, and so now the eggs will then hatch inside the cow. Then the larva form will burrow into the cow, eating the cow and growing. Once it's grown to a certain size, it'll become a sporocyst in the meat of the cow. Then a human will kill that cow and then turn it into meat to be eaten. Now if that meat is not cooked all the way, the sporocysts are still alive. And so that human will eat the meat and the stomach acid will revitalize the, the tapeworms. That sporocyst will then turn into the adult tapeworm, which will end up in the intestines of the human. And once in the intestines, it'll latch on, it'll eat the nutrients of the human, and it will continue to grow longer and longer, releasing eggs in the fecal matter of the human. And this will continue the tapeworm's life cycle. Well, I know platyhelminthes can sound pretty disgusting, especially the parasitic ones, but I hope you enjoyed learning about this amazing phyla of worms and this amazing phyla of animals. If you're curious to learn more about tapeworms and trematodes, check out my video on both tapeworms and trematodes. I will see you guys next time.